بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين In the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful. This is our 11th session, our 12th session about lesson 9. In this lesson, we are going to study the relation that exists between philosophy and sciences. Before we discuss the relation or relations, we will see whether it is one or more. The relation or relations between philosophy and sciences, we should know that each science or each discipline or each field of study has its own integrity and we cannot uh, mix them up. We should know that, for example, physics is different from chemistry. Chemistry is different from biology. Biology is different from, for example, metaphysics. Metaphysics is different from mysticism or gnosis. Each discipline, each field of study is independent in the sense that it has its own subject matter, its own problems, and its own aims and objectives. Of course, when we want to classify sciences, we may find similarities between some sciences in their methodology or, for example, in their subject matters or, for example, in their aims. So we may put them together and classify them under one type. But no science can be uh, mixed with another science. So this is something that we should bear in mind, that all sciences and disciplines are independent in their integrity. But on the other hand, we should know that this independence of sciences in their problems does not mean that they don't need each other or there is no, for example, interactions between them. It is like, for example, two independent countries. They are independent in the same, in the sense that each has its own authority, its own uh, uh, state and government and so on and so forth. But there are many ways in which countries need each other, support each other, depend on each other. So, having said that, now let's go into the discussion which is studied in the lesson. The author says that there are ways in which sciences may help each other. For example, you know that in physics, 
we need to borrow many, many mathematical ideas and the dependence of physics on mathematics is very clear. Indeed, it's one of best examples to show how natural sciences depend on, for example, mathematics. Or, for example, in intellectual sciences, suppose, for example, in ethics, in morality, one of the things that we need to know is whether we are free or not. You know, the issue of free will or determinism is one of the very historical issues which is discussed in philosophy and also in philosophical psychology. So to be able to study moral values, to be able to talk about which qualities we should acquire or which qualities we should get far from, we need first of all to establish the idea of free will. And this is something that we cannot discuss it in ethics itself. This is something that we should establish before entering into ethical studies. For example, in philosophical psychology. And this is to show that how an intellectual science like ethics may depend on another intellectual science like philosophical psychology or like metaphysics itself, because in metaphysics itself also we discuss about the issue of free will. The author goes on explaining the relation between metaphysics and sciences. I mean by sciences, empirical sciences. So he says that there are ways in which philosophy can help and support sciences. First of all, if you remember when we were talking about the idea of each science having a subject matter, we said that in many cases the existence of the subject matter may not be self-evident. If the existence of the subject matter is evident, is self-evident, so we don't need any proof for that. But whenever we need a proof for the existence of the subject matter, we need to refer to philosophy. Philosophy helps us to secure the existence of the subject matter. And this is one of the principles, one of al-mabad, which we need to take from philosophy. And you remember that we said sciences, in many cases, depend on their principles in their principles on philosophy. So to prove the existence of the subject matter, we need to refer to philosophy. Some philosophers, great philosophers, like, for example, the author of Al-Qabasat, that is Mirda Ahmad, have argued that this is the area in which 
all sciences, all different sources of knowledge depend on philosophy because all of them need philosophy to prove the existence of their subject matter. But the author says that this may be an exaggeration and we may just say that for those sciences whose subject matter is not self-evident, we need philosophy to prove the existence of the subject matter. Otherwise, we don't need to enter into philosophical discussions. This is one example of support that philosophy may provide. The other example or the other area is to prove the um, propositions that we need in certain science. Each science may need some uh, very general and universal principles, some postulates that we cannot discuss or prove in the science itself. These are principles that must be established before interest to that science. So for such postulates, for such general propositions that we presuppose before entering that discipline, we need philosophy. For example, if you consider the investigations that scientists do in their, for example, labs, in their places of study and investigation, you see that one thing that they all presuppose is the principle of causality. If a scientist does not believe in causality, why should he bother himself to analyze the interactions between different substances? Why should he bother himself to come to a general uh, explanation about the way that we can produce something? The only reason that they do all these efforts and they undertake all this trouble is that they know in their mind and they have as they very uh, as one of the basic and underlying propositions that whenever there is an effect whenever there is a phenomenon whenever there is something as a contingent being you need a cause to explain it and this is the principle of causality which says that every effect needs a cause and if you remember we said that in philosophy we discussed the criterion for need and we say that the need is produced by the fact that an effect is contingent, is a possible being. Inshallah, we will discuss it properly later. Just to give you some very general idea, we should know that the principle of causality is very, very important. And this is one of the things that you need to uh, uh, take in board before entering into scientific studies. And this is what you, you can take it from philosophy. Or, or, for example, more than causality, 
the necessary relation between cause and effect. This is also something that you need. Because if you believe that whenever there is a complete cause, there is an effect, but not necessarily. Maybe there will be an effect, and maybe the effect does not come into existence. If you have this in your mind, again, whole structure of the sciences collapses. Because then it means that you may have all the conditions, you may secure all the requirements, and still not to have the effect that you are looking for. You may make lots of, for example, investments to produce, for example, uh, missiles for scientific discoveries and send the missile into the air. But if you have the idea that everything may be there, every requirement may be fulfilled and still it may not happen, it's a matter of just arbitrary choice, so you will not have the same courage to continue your scientific studies. So this principle of causality or the principle of the necessary relation between a complete cause and effect are two examples to show that how we may need philosophy to provide us with these general presuppositions before we enter into certain scientific field of study. So, philosophy helps us in our empirical studies by securing the existence of the subject matter if it is not self-evident and by providing us with some um, underlying propositions, some postulates that we need and we cannot prove it without philosophy. Now let's go to the other side of the coin to see whether there are ways in which sciences can help philosophy. Up to now we were talking about the ways that philosophy supports sciences. Now let's see, is there any way that a science or natural sciences in general can help and support philosophy? The author says that, as we said before, philosophy is not in need of any science. The only science that may be said is needed for philosophical inquiry is epistemology and logic. And those are things that we already know. And just we need epistemology and logic to articulate the ideas that we know by the uh, way that our mind is created and works. So we need just philosophy and logic, uh, sorry, epistemology and logic to articulate those things that we can know by ourselves. But apart from them, we said philosophy does not depend on any other disciplines. Philosophy is like a mother for all other disciplines. But this does not mean that philosophy, which is independent, cannot be 
benefited from or by other sciences. For example, one of the things that philosophy can benefit from other sciences is that sometimes when you have a philosophical argument as your minor premise, you may use some findings of sciences. Because you know that whenever you have two premises, the major premise is the main one. And the nature of argument is formed by the major premise. If the major premise is intellectual, the argument is intellectual. If the major premise is empirical, the argument is empirical. And if both premises are intellectual, that is purely intellectual argument. Anyway, the burden of argument, or you could say the weight of argument, mostly lies in the major one. And the minor is just an instance or a particular of the major one. Okay. So you may have a rational or an intellectual major premise in philosophy. But as your minor premise, you may use one of the findings of the sciences. And there is no problem in that. And this helps you to come to a new conclusion, which is indeed a further actualization or realization of the principle that you already know. For example, if you know that the physical matters all are changing, including human body. Human body is changing. It's not fixed. Not only it's subject to reduction or increase, but also it's subject to total change. And in every five, six years, all our cells are changed, except the cells in the nervous system. So the cells of our hands and feet and other parts of the body, except the nervous system, all change. This is something that we can learn from biology. Okay, so we use this and we add it to the fact that our identity does not change. And we have an awareness of our identity which is constant which accepts and admits no change and alteration. I am the same person that was there 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. The same person, exactly the same, without any feeling of change or increase or decrease. Okay, my qualities may improve or may, uh, God forbid, may, I may be in loss, but I'm the same person. But 
if I was a, just a physical body, this body is not the same as the body which used to be there before. We are not now to discuss about this issue. We are not now to prove the spirituality of our reality, to prove that there is an abstract spirit. This was just to give you an example that how we may borrow the findings of sciences, like the change that I said occurs in our body, to add it into some intellectual uh, premises to come to a philosophical conclusion. So this is the way that philosophy can be benefited from the scientific findings. The other way that philosophy is helped by empirical sciences is that in philosophy you need new issues, new topics, new problems to reflect on. If you want your philosophy to flourish, if you want your philosophy to be dynamic, to be in motion, to be in improvement, so you need to inject new topics so that philosophers can reflect on and can expand the area of philosophical inquiry. Many, many new issues are taken from empirical sciences. So empirical sciences, like other sciences, like for example mysticism and other things, can help us in generating new issues, new subjects for philosophizing. And this is very important. This is the same thing that we say about the relation between theology and philosophy. You know that there were many controversies between early, or you could say between some of the early Muslim theologians and early philosophers. In some cases, they were even considering each other as a disbeliever. So the theologians were saying that, for example, these philosophers are not real Muslims. And you know that Ghazali had the book Tahafut al-Falasafah to refute the ideas of philosophy. And he said that there are three topics in which philosophers can be considered to be a kafir. So there was a very heated debate among some theologians and some philosophers. I'm not saying all theologians. But one of the ways in which these controversies helped philosophy was that these controversies, these attacks, these accusations provided more subjects for philosophers to reflect on. So philosophers had to work hard to be able to give answers to these questions. They couldn't be relaxed because more and more subjects were created for them to think about. So these troubling attacks, these troubling accusations, in a sense, were very helpful for philosophy. So 
we are now going back to the relation between empirical sciences and philosophy. So one of the ways that empirical sciences can help philosophy is to create new areas of thought for philosophers, to create new subjects for philosophizing. So this is also something which is very important. The author refers to some of the ideas which are introduced by modern physics and create new problems for, for philosophy. For example, in modern physics, there has been lots of attention paid towards the lead, uh, relation between matter and energy. Is energy a form of matter or is it different and also about the relation between matter, energy and field? All these need to be philosophically philosophically studied to see whether, for example, there are some features, some uh, qualities for a physical matter that can be philosophically proved so that we can conclude that what uh, um, ever material that you have, whatever thing that you have, which has no quality of those mentioned for physical matters, cannot be classified under the title of matter. For example, if we say that philosophically, every matter must have some size or must be three-dimensional. So if we can secure this philosophically, so if you have something which has no size or no three dimensions, so we can argue that this is not a physical matter. So you can argue that, for example, energy is not a form of matter. There may be uh, um, changeable to each other, into each other, but they are not the same. They are not identical. Or, for example, what is the difference between matter in the physical sense or philosophical sense? These are ideas that must be discussed and studied in philosophy. So modern sciences create new issues, new topics, new problems for philosophers. And this is very helpful contribution that modern sciences can have. Having studied the relation between modern sciences or empirical sciences and philosophy, the author says that now let's study the relation between philosophy and Erfan. Erfan is sometimes translated into English as gnosis and sometimes as mysticism. Uh, so I personally, of course, prefer mysticism, but some people also use gnosis. So what is the relation between philosophy and Erfan or mysticism? 
First of all, we should know what is the definition of Irfan. Irfan literally means knowledge. It's from the root Arafa in Arabic, which means knowledge. And Arafa is the past tense of Ma'rafa. So Ma'rafa means knowledge and Arafa means new. So whenever in Arabic there is a close and direct knowledge about a particular thing, the term Ma'rafa can be used. And whenever there is a general there is a indirect knowledge, the term Ma'rafa cannot be used. If you know a person, for example, if you know Ali, if you know, for example, Hassan or Zaid, in person, you can use the term Ma'rafa. You can say, A'rafuhu. But if you know just by description, for example, some people have told you about this person, that there is a person living in, for example, certain place, he has this quality and he works this. So you come to some knowledge, some understanding about that person, but you don't know him in person. Here you cannot use the term Ma'rifa in Arabic. This is the literal meaning of Irfan or Ma'rifa. Muslim scholars have used this term for our close and immediate knowledge of God. In mysticism, we are not satisfied with philosophical understanding of God. We are not satisfied with conceptual understanding of God. We want to know God directly. We want to feel God. We want to be filled with our awareness of God. This is why this is called Erfan. So Erfan is a very important science, a very important discipline, and inshallah you uh, should have a chance in future to study Irfan in more details. But what is important for us at this moment is to know the relation between Irfan and philosophy. The author says that philosophy, by its nature, is not in need of Erfan. As we said before, philosophy is independent in its principles, in its al-mabadi, and in its problems. But still, we can say that there are ways that philosophy can be benefited by mysticism. For example, mysticism can create new problems, new issues for philosophical reflection. Exactly the same thing that we said before about empirical sciences. Whenever there is a mystical finding or a mystical vision or a mystical achievement which needs to be interpreted, which needs to be explained through the concepts, philosophy comes into the scene and philosophy in this way is helped because the more work that you create for philosophers, the more tasks that you give to philosophers, the more chance you give to them 
to expand philosophy. So this is one way in which philosophy can be helped by mysticism. The other way is by supporting philosophical arguments with mystical findings or visions or in a sense arguments. You may have your own philosophical argument for something. Maybe sometimes you have more than one argument for same subject, for same problem. But if a mystic has witnessed the truth that lies in this argument by his intuition, by his mystical vision, this will help the philosopher to be more confident about the truth of his own argument. So it's like a backup for your philosophical argument. There are also ways in which philosophy can help mysticism. First of all, the author refers to the fact that you can have no mysticism without having a proper knowledge of God. So before you are able to start your spiritual journey, your spiritual way favor, which leads to the mystical knowledge of God, you must first of all be obedient to God. You must be a person who is religiously committed. You must be a person who believes in the true religion of God. So how is it possible to argue for the existence of God? You need some philosophical or rational argument to begin with. Of course, later, when you have your direct and immediate knowledge of God, so you no longer need conceptual knowledge about God. But in the beginning, at least, you need this knowledge which can be provided by philosophy or the intellectual theology. The other way in which the philosophy can help us in mysticism is to give us some instruments to distinguish between genuine mystical findings and illusions. Because unfortunately, on many occasions, illusions, confusions, and mistakes happen to uh, the people who are involved in mysticism. They think that this is a genuine uh, mystical achievement, but it's just an illusion. So they need some strong, some um, sound and valid grounds to be able to distinguish between genuine mysticism and the illusions that may occur to them. And this is where philosophy can be very helpful. So if a person in his mysticism comes to some findings which contradict the intellectual premises that we have, so we can understand that this is a mistake. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us our reason, our aql, our intellect, 
as a hodja, as a proof. And this does not this, uh, mislead us. So we should always be careful not to do anything against our reason, our aql, which has been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us. The third way in which philosophy can help mysticism is to help a mystic to find ways to communicate his mystical finding. You know that whenever a mystic comes to some, for example, vision or, for example, to some mystical perception, this cannot be communicated to other people because they are not able to have the same experience without preparing themselves spiritually. So they always can listen to a mystic telling his experiences, but they cannot have the same experiences without themselves being involved in the spiritual wayfaring. So the mystic, what can do at most is to translate his findings into the conceptual language which is familiar to us. And whenever you want to use concepts, philosophy is very important because philosophy can tell you how to put your ideas into words how to use concepts in the way that they can properly be understood and they can properly convey your spiritual message. So this is the third area in which philosophy can help mysticism. So all together in this lesson, we discussed the relation between philosophy and sciences. And we said that although sciences are all independent in their integrity, but there are ways in which they may help each other, they may support each other, and they may have interactions among each other. And then we said that philosophy does not need any science to provide it with its subject matter or its principles. But uh, still philosophy can be benefited from sciences and sciences can be also benefited and helped uh, by philosophy. And we said that, for example, philosophy can prove the existence of the subject matter if the subject matter of that science is not self-evident and also uh, philosophy can provide the propositions which are needed for that science like the principle of causality and sciences also can help philosophy by providing them with some premises which can be used in the philosophical arguments, like, for example, providing minor premise in um, medicine or in physics for the argument for the uh, existence of the abstract spirit which we mentioned. And also sciences can help in creating new areas for reflection, new subjects for philosophizing. And then we said that there is also a relation between philosophy and mysticism. Philosophy can help mysticism by 
first of all, arguing for the existence of God, and secondly, by distinguishing between genuine mysticism and uh, the mistaken one, and also by helping a mystic to conceptualize his uh, mystical finding. And at the same time, mysticism can help philosophy by creating new subjects and by backing up philosophical arguments. So, alhamdulillah, we studied the relation between philosophy and uh, other sciences. And inshallah, in the next lesson, we will talk about the necessity of philosophy. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين